Hello, my name is Dr. Davina Lloyd, and with me today is the Honourable Dr. Jocelyn Scott AO. Jocelyn is the president of the Cedar People's Tribunal, a barrister at Inner Temple, a senior teaching fellow and former academic, visiting fellow and visiting professor at universities here in Australia and in the United States. She's also a Cambridge graduate and was a visiting fellow and alumni at Lucy Cavendish College and an alumni of Burton, the very first women's college at Cambridge, and in fact, one of the first ones in the UK. Additionally, she's the author of some 30 non-fiction books, author and editor of crime fiction novels and short stories, and hundreds of legal articles. She holds a PhD, an SJD, which is a Doctor of the Science of Jurisprudence, and an honorary LLD, a Doctor of Law. Five master's degrees, two in law, two in arts, and one in film, video, and news screen media, an LLB, and a number of professional qualifications, including in arbitration and legal studies. She is the book review and comments editor of the Denning Law Journal, and is an accomplished filmmaker. Wow, Jocelyn, so much to talk about. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, can we start at the beginning? Um, you've been a barrister specialising in human rights, equal opportunities, anti-discrimination, and the rights of minorities, amongst other things, for over 35 years. What made you first become involved in the women's rights arena? Well, perhaps I should go back to my grandmothers because grandmothers are always important. Um, my maternal grandmother was a woman's delegate to the first ever Labour Women's Conference in the world. It was held in Fremantle in Western Australia. And my paternal grandmother was one of those women who was extremely firm and strong. They both were very strong women. But I became a lawyer because of the maternal grandmother. My family engages in debate and we engaged in debate always at the breakfast table, at the dinner table, um, listening to um, parliament, et cetera. And I was in the middle of a debate, if I can put it in those terms, with my maternal grandmother. I remember it well in her dining room. And I won the debate. And she said to me, Jocelyn, you will just have to be a lawyer. So that's what I became. And of course, I had the opportunity to have a scholarship to teachers college. But I remember posting it back and my father saying to me, are you sure that this is what you want? And I was sure. I mean, the exchange with my grandmother took place when I was about 11 years of age. And human rights have always been important because if one sees justice, one can't really allow it to continue. And because of my father's job, I grew up in Australia, because of my father's job, he worked for Wes Farmers, we sometimes lived in the country. And I remember so distinctively York, which is one of the oldest towns in Western Australia, it has a large population of Indigenous Australians. And I have an image of going to school and the Indigenous Australians standing at the side of the road and that it wasn't fair that they should be included in the same way that we were included. And I felt that really strongly. And just disadvantage, it's not fair that some people have more than others. And when people's rights are being trampled on, it's necessary to do something about it. And I ended up going to the bar, I did a lot of things before I went to the bar, but I ended up going to the bar because that's what I always wanted to do. That's where you really can fight for rights. But also, in the end, what precipitated me, ultimately, I was the Deputy Chair of the Law Reform Commission of Victoria. And the judge with whom I'd worked, I was an associate to a High Court judge. And he rang me when he was in the middle of a, an extremely despairing situation for himself. And I just said to him about a hiccup that had happened in my career. And he said to me, Jocelyn, he said, 
get yourself together. You're worth 60,000 of them, get to the bar. And so I did. And I've never forgotten that because he's one of my great mentors and that he, Justice Murphy, would take the time to actually give me advice and to encourage me in that way. You're worth 60,000 of them was supremely important, really important. I've been so fortunate in having mentors like that who believed in me and therefore I've been committed to human rights since being a child and it's simply something that you can't give up. You'd know that yourself, Dr Lloyd. You can't give it up. It won't let you give it up. No, thank you very much for that, um, Jocelyn. Now, at the tribunal in June, you heard many of the witnesses talking about the fact that women are not heard, women are not listened to, women are obviously disadvantaged, and nobody seems to be doing very much about it. Now, you did work, uh, a lot of work in Australia um, as an anti-discrimination commissioner in Tasmania, and I wonder if you could tell us about something about that, about your views of women's voices and the importance of women being heard? One of the important aspects of the anti-discrimination commissioner role was that the act that I was fortunate to implement was the Anti-Discrimination Act that was passed in 1998. And it's still the most forward-looking equal opportunity or anti-discrimination legislation of which I know. And it was flexible in that I was able to interpret provisions in a way that advanced women's rights. For example, um, it was possible to, through that legislation, to address the issue of vilification of women on a sex-based ground. Uh, that is what's now being talked about being implemented here, mis misogynistic language, images, and so on. And I had a number of cases like that, that I was able to advance through that legislation. Um, also, what was important in the work that I was able to do in Australia, I worked on the Women's Electoral Lobby draft bill of, uh, on rape and other sexual offences. That was dated 1977. And that was when I was working in Sydney at the Australian Law Reform Commission and working with the Women's Electoral Lobby and two really wonderful fighters for women's rights, Di Graham, who's now dead and missed very much, and Kerry Hubell, who is still alive and um, loved very much. And we worked solidly to change the way that rape law operated. We incorporated into that bill a proper definition of consent, what was consent and what was not. And that was a real first for that time. I'd had the good fortune to work um, when I was studying in the United States with Professor Virginia Nordby, who changed rape law in Michigan in 1974. And it was the work I'd done before I went to Michigan. I'd already worked on crimes against women and crimes by women because you have to look at both sides because, for example, when women kill, then it's really important to look at what are the circumstances, what's the dynamic. But I'd looked at rape law and she asked me to write a paper on rape in marriage. And that was when I realised that, the law on rape in marriage had been so misinterpreted, it rested on two issues that rape in marriage was not a crime. One was Chief Justice Hale. And Chief Justice Hale's book on crime, published first in 1636, and it's gone through numerous editions and is still used as a principal source uh, by um, criminal lawyers in many respects. Chief Justice Hale said, that rape in marriage was not a crime. Now, because he said it, we were supposed to believe that was true. He was the judge who sat on the last trial of witches in this country, from the Fen country they were. And he actually said that witches were real, 
because there they were in his court being found guilty of witchcraft, number one, and number two, the Bible said so. Now, that was Chief Justice Hale who told us that rape in marriage was not a crime. The second basis of saying rape in marriage was not a crime was a case of the Crown and Clarence in 1888. And that case, it was a civil case. It was the, the woman had been infected with um, syphilis or gonorrhea by the husband. This happened quite a lot at the end of the 19th century. And the issue, therefore, of rape in marriage was not directly before the court, but it was before the House of Lords, and most of the judges addressed it. And most of the judges did not say that rape in marriage was not a crime. There was only one who went to that extent. And he even said that if the wife was walking down the stairs to go off shopping, to spend her money on fripperies and so forth, to spend, oh, sorry, his money, the husband's money on fripperies, then he had a right to keep her in his house, which of course there was another case that contradicted that anyway in 1891. But that case had actually been put forward as a, another authority on this issue of rape in marriage. And it didn't say that at all. In fact, I've published on that in, uh, I think it's in the Monish Law Journal um, on marital rape. And therefore, when I wrote that paper for Professor Nordby, that launched me into this uh, uh, project really to change the rape laws in Australia. And that uh, well draft bill on rape and other sexual offences has actually been used as a, a, a template in other countries. It's been looked at in Canada, it's been looked at in Fiji, it's even been looked at by some in this country. And then the um, other point I'd like to make about that is that in that draft bill, we put in the provision that it should be compulsory for the judiciary and for practitioners when this law reform went through, that they should have training in it and that should be compulsory. And I remember being at a conference where I put forward this proposition and was promptly contradicted sadly by the woman whom I admire very much, but who became the first woman judge on the High Court of Australia. Um, she may well not remember it, but I certainly remember it. It was a conference at the Wentworth Hotel. We were sharing a platform, she, myself, and a couple of others. And I said that the judges should have compulsory education. No, no, no. That was the conclusion of others on that panel. Well, I now say that in Canada this year, they have passed a law some 30 years it would be, wouldn't it, after the World Draft Bill saying that judges should have compulsory education in relation to changes to rape laws. And so therefore, one feels vindicated some 30 years on. They're finally catching up with you, um, Justin, <laughs> and finally listening again. Now, You've had a very varied experience of, of different sorts of work uh, during your lifetime. Is, is there any other experiences that you think have been particularly um, uh, significant in determining how you feel about women's rights at the moment? I think that earlier you mentioned women's voices and women not being heard. I always took my... Um, I suppose, guide from the women's refuge movement, because when the women's refuge movement was in full flight, those women were absolutely on the ball. And if I said something, if I, I didn't, but if I had said something that they thought was coming from the wrong direction, I'd have listened to myself very carefully because those women were working on the ground with women who had been victims and survivors of criminal assault at home and other forms of domestic violence. And when you work in, on the ground, in the grassroots in that way, you actually do um, have a really dedicated knowledge of an understanding of the impact on women of the discrimination and the misogyny that exist in society. And when I wrote the book, Even in the Best of Homes, Violence in the Family, that was published in the first edition in 1983 and republished with an update chapter in 1990. I had women contacting me about that book and saying to me that 
the book ex it described exactly the circumstances that they've been living in, how they've been treated and what they had to put up within the legal system. I did a, a, a study of 312 families that is written up in that, in that book. And um, I analysed what had gone on. It's got, the first part is on child abuse, physical abuse, child sexual abuse, there's spouse assault, there's rape in marriage and marital murder. And then the second half is on the, um, on the resources that are supposed to be addressing this, that off to a counsellor, off to a church or a synagogue or whichever the religion is, off to the police, off to counsellors and so on. And to a woman, these women said, none of those resources was a, were a help. The only resource that was a help were the women's refuges. And that was the women's refuges run by women who were feminist women and who actually therefore were actually listening to the women and the women had not been listened to. And perhaps the final point I'll make on that is that the case I took to the High Court the Oslin case, which I can refer to directly because it's a reported case. Um, in that case, amongst many other issues, my client, Heather Oslin, had been to the police and there was no record or few records. And this is the problem. A woman would come to the police and there'd be the desk sergeant who's supposed to make a record and there was no record. And on that case, What's really fascinating is that the next door neighbour had gone to the police and said, this is all on record, he'd said that he was worried and afraid because the man that lived next door to him was accusing him of having an affair with his wife. Oh, says the police officer, right, 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 in the, the desk book. And he looked up and he said to this man, and who is your next door neighbour? The man said, it's Frank Osman. Oh, said the police officer, putting down the pen. All I can advise you to do is move. So this is a police officer in a circumstance where Heather Osman had complained to the police about the violence of the man to whom she was married and she'd been poo-pooed. Many women in the family court will find this, that they're poo-pooed. But a man walks in, says, I'm afraid of the next door neighbour, and there you have it. It's serious, and they recognise him as a serious danger. And just a final example of that, they were called, he'd left the home. It was her home. She'd paid for the mortgage, everything. And she'd managed to get rid of him for a temporary period. He came back crashing and bashing, as happens. And the police were called and the police came. They left their car down the end of the drive with the lights flashing. And they proceeded up the drive. They got halfway up. They saw him at the top of the drive. They turned away and went, went away. He had torn the flywire door off the house. Now, in Australia, one has hot weather. And to cope with the hot weather, one leaves one's front door open or back door open, whichever it is, and there will be what we call a flywire door. House flies are a problem and they come in. You have um, delicate wire which will stop them. He'd ripped the whole door from the uh, door frame and these police saw him there and they disappeared, leaving, of course, Heather Oslin to cope with this dangerous man. And that's the problem of women not being listened to. They are not listened to, but men's voices are heard. And we must change that. And the final point on this I'll say is that everything I've done, I'd say thank you to all the women with whom I've had contact and who've been so supportive of me in the work that I've done, because that makes it possible to keep on. You have to have five really close women friends around you in order to be able to keep going. And I'm one of those fortunate women who does. 
Thank you so much, Justin. Now, you, you, we know that you've worked internationally all over the world in the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, Germany and Fiji. How does all this work internationally provide the basis for the President's report with proposals for the UK government? CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, is an international document it's a treaty that this government of the United Kingdom has signed and has ratified. It's made a commitment to CEDAW. It's made a commitment to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that it will incorporate it into domestic law. That's one of the principal um, elements of CEDAW. In terms of international work, that's crucial because I've had the good fortune to live and study in the United States at Southern Methodist University in Texas, MSU, at the University of Michigan. I've been a visiting professor at Penn State in Pennsylvania. I've studied and been a member of the research team at the Max Planck Institute for Criminology and Criminal Law in uh, Freiburg, in Breisgau, in Germany. I've, um, of course, studied in Australia and I'm a graduate of a number of universities, the University of Western Australia, the University of Sydney, the University of New South Wales. And I've also, I'm admitted to practice in every jurisdiction in Australia. Australia is based on common law, Australia's law, just as in the United Kingdom. And the common law, of course, exists in, the, in Canada. And the common law is the basis of the law in the United States too, apart from some state uh, like Louisiana, where there's some emphasis on, on French law. And then um, in addition to my practice all over Australia, um, and my work as an anti-discrimination commissioner. I was a judge and fortunate to be a judge in Fiji, one of the great Pacific Island state uh, nations. And that work was also crucial because I was working together with people from, an, um, from the, the, there's an Indian Fijian population, there's a native Fijian population, there's a Chinese Fijian population, and there's an Anglo Fijian population. Fiji is counted as a developing country, and I was able to make a contribution in legal terms, in their legal system. And that also is a good standby in terms of reflecting on the meaning of CEDAW, its application um, to black and minoritized women, um, its application to uh, women with a disability, its application to women from all sorts of backgrounds, and also, of course, to women who are in the position of being asylum seekers and refugees. And I've actually worked in uh, my legal practice in Australia included immigration work too. And therefore, one can say indisputably that that international knowledge, the international training and um, qualifications and living in other cultures is absolutely crucial to what this country wants to achieve. This country is comprised of citizens and residents from many cultural backgrounds. And that is a key to what we want to ensure is implemented in CEDAW becoming domestic law in this country. And one needs an international perspective in order to appreciate the position in the United Kingdom, which is its own position and which therefore needs to be reflected in the Bill of Rights for Women. There's no doubt internationalism and local domestic uh, appreciation and knowledge are crucial. And I've studied in this country. I've lived in this country. I'm living in this country. One can't live in this country without actually appreciating 
um, the origins here and the way that the society operates and acts. And I've been fortunate, perhaps I should add, to hold an elected position. I was elected to the county county a county council of Cambridgeshire in 2013 and re-elected in 2017. And then this year in um, 21 was elected to the city council. That means that I must have some definite connection with the people of this country and thus able to represent what the evidence that's been put to us from all the wonderful witnesses who appeared before the um, CEDAW Tribunal, which will be incorporated into the report and the recommendations of the report will arise out of the evidence that those um, witnesses have provided and the wonderful work of the legal assistants who've been working with the tribunal um, for one year now. Thank you ever so much, Jocelyn. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us? <laughs> Just that I'm really proud and honoured to have been appointed as the president of the CEDAW Women's Tribunal. I appreciate all the work that's gone in by the organising committee, by the various parts of the CEDAW Tribunal operation. And the, we've had the good fortune, for example, of the Garden Court um, barristers as counsel assisting the tribunal who presented and um, put questions to the witnesses in a way that was extraordinarily helpful and that also the summary of the evidence was extremely helpful too. It's really helpful to have the evidence of the witnesses in their written statements, in their oral statements before the tribunal, those witnesses who were not able to appear but who presented their evidence in interview. And therefore, I simply say, it's my honour to be the president and it's my honour to produce the report which will go forward. We are trusting to be the basis upon which this country, the United Kingdom, will honour its obligations under CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, will honour their commitment by incorporating CEDAW into domestic law in the form of a Women's Bill of Rights. Wow, thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, that's amazing. And I know we could have talked for another hour or so because you've had such, so many uh, different experiences that you could tell us about. Um, we at the CPT feel we couldn't be in a better place for someone so, so authoritatively write up our report of the evidence that we've got from our hearings and the proposals and recommendations for the government. We are eagerly anticipating the forthcoming president's report. And thank you so much from all of us women everywhere for everything you have done and continue to do for women and girls across the whole world. Um, the CPT is delighted, honored, and very privileged to be working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. Thank you, Davina. And thank you to all those involved in the CEDAW Women's Tribunal. And I pay tribute to all those who've supported me for all the years past. Thank you.